Chapter Four of Anthony Trent, Master Criminal, by Wyndham Martin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Chapter Four, Beginning the Game. When he left Weems, it was too late to start a round of golf, so Trent took his homeward way, intent on starting another story. Crosby was always urging him to turn out more of them. His boarding house room seemed shabbier than ever. The rug, which had never been a good one showed its age. The steel engravings on the wall were offensive. And Weems, he thought, owns a constable. His upright piano sounded thinner to his touch. And Weems, he sighed, has been able to buy a grand. Up from the kitchen the triumphant smell of a boiled New England dinner sought out every corner of the house. High above all the varied odors, cabbage was king. The prospect of the dinner-table was appalling, with Mr. Lund, distant and ready to quarrel over any infringement of his rights or curtailment of his portion, Mrs. Clark ready to resent any jest as to her lord's habits, the landlady eager to give battle to such as sniffed at what her kitchen had to offer, wearisome banter between brainless boarders tending mainly to criticism of moving-picture productions and speculations as to the salaries of the stars. Not a soul there who had ever heard of William Blake or Ravel. Overdressed girls who were permanently annoyed with Anthony Trent because he would never take them to ice-cream parlours. Each new boarder, as she came, set her cap for him, and he remained courteous but disinterested. One of the epics of Mrs. Sawyer's boarding-house was that night when Miss Margaret Rafferty, incensed at the coldness with which her advances were received and the jeers of her girlfriends, brought as a dinner-guest a former sweetheart, now enthusiastically patrolling city sidewalks as a guardian of the peace. It was not difficult to inflame Maguire. He disliked Anthony Trent on sight, and exercised an untrammelled wit during the dinner at his expense. It was afterwards in the little garden, where the men went to smoke an after-dinner cigar, that the unforgivable phrase was passed. Maguire was just able to walk home. He had met an antagonist who was a lightning hitter, whose footwork was quick, and who boxed admirably and kept his head. After this, a greater meed of courtesy was accorded the writer of stories. But the bibulous Clark alone amused him, Clark who had been city editor of a great daily when Trent was a police reporter on it, and was now a Park Road derelict, supported by the generosity of his old friends and acquaintances. Only Mrs. Clark knew that Anthony Trent, on numerous occasions, gave her a little money each week until that day in the Greek calends when her husband would find another position. Anthony Trent settled himself at his typewriter and began looking over the carbon copy of the story he had just sold to Crosby. He wished to assure himself of certain details in it. Among the pages was an envelope with the name of a celebrated Fifth Avenue club embossed upon it. Written on it in pencil was Crosby's name. Unquestionably he had swept it from the editorial desk when he had taken up the carbon copy of his story. Opening it, he found a note written in a rather cramped and angular hand. The stationery was of the Fifth Avenue Club. The signature was unmistakable. Connington Warren. Trent read, My dear Crosby, I am sending this note by Togoyama because I want to be sure that you will lunch with me at Voisin's tomorrow at one o'clock. I wish affairs permitted me to see more of my old Yale comrades, but I am enormously busy. By the way, a little friend of mine thinks she can write. I don't suppose she can, but I promise to show her efforts to you. I am no judge, but it seems to me her work is very much the kind you publish in your magazine. We will talk it over tomorrow. Of course, she cares nothing about what you would pay her. She wants to see her name in print. Yours ever, Connington Warren. Trent picked up an eraser and passed it over the name on the envelope. It had been written with a soft pencil and was easily swept away. Over the body of the letter he spent a longer time. He copied it exactly. A stranger would have sworn that the copy had been written by the same hand which indicted the original. And when this copy had been made to Trent's satisfaction, he carefully erased everything in the original but the signature. Then, remembering Weems' description of the Connaughton Warren camp in the Adirondacks, he wrote a little note to one Togoyama. It was five when he had finished. There was no indecision about him. Twenty minutes later he was at the public library, consulting a large volume in which were a hundred of the best-known residences in New York. So conscientious was the writer that there were plans of every floor, 
and in many instances descriptions of their interior decoration. Anthony Trent chuckled to think of the difficulties with which the unlettered crook has to contend. Chicago at Binner, for example, had married half a hundred servant-maids to obtain information as to the disposition of rooms that he could have obtained by the mere consultation of such a book as this. It was while Mrs. Sorris' wards were finishing their boiled dinner that some of them had a glimpse of Anthony Trent in evening dress descending the stairs. "'Dinner not good enough for his nips,' commented one boarder, seeking to curry the sore favour. "'I'd rather have my boarders pay and not eat than eat and not pay,' said Mrs. Sorr grimly. It was three weeks since she had received a dollar from the speaker. "'Drink!' exclaimed Mr. Clark, suddenly roused from meditation of a day now dead when a highball could be purchased for fifteen cents. "'This food shortage now, that could be settled easily.' Take the tax off liquor, and people wouldn't want to eat so much. It's the high cost of drinking that's the trouble. What's the use of calling ourselves a free people? I tell you, it was keeping vodka from the Russians that caused the whole trouble. Don't argue with me, I know. Mr. Clark went from the dinner-table to his bed, and awoke around midnight, possessed with the seven demons of unsatiated thirst. He determined to go down and call upon Anthony Trent. He would plead for enough money to go to the druggist and get his wife's prescription filled. Trent, good lad that he was, always fell for it. And, he argued, it was a friendly act to do, this midnight call on a hard-working young writer who had once been at his command. For the first time Anthony Trent's door was locked, and the voice that snapped out an interrogation was different from the leisurely and amiable invitation to enter which was usual. The door was suddenly flung open so sudden that poor Clark was startled, and facing him, his fists clenched and a certain tensity of attitude that was a strange one to the visitor, was Anthony Trent, still in evening dress. Clark construed it into an expression of resentment at his intrusion. He could not understand the sudden affability that took possession of his former reporter. "'Come in, Mr. Clark,' said Trent cordially. "'I'm sorry your wife's heart is troubling her, but I agree with you that you should rush with all haste to the nearby druggist and have that prescription filled, as the man who owes you money did not pay you today as he promised, but will without fail to-morrow at midday. Take this five-dollar bill with my blessing. "'How did you know?' gasped Clark. "'I'm a mind-reader,' Trent retorted. "'It saves time.' He led Mr. Clark gently to the door. "'Now I'm tired and want to go to sleep.' "'So don't call in on your way back with a change. "'Just trot up to bed as quietly as you can.' "'When the door was locked and a chair back wedged against the handle, "'Trent lowered the shades. "'Then he cleared his table of the litter of paper. "'A half-dozen pages of the first draft of his new story "'held his attention for a few seconds. "'Then he deliberately tore the pages into little fragments, "'threw them into the waste-paper basket.' and to this senate half he added the contents of the table-drawer, made up of notes for future stories, the results of weeks of labour. "'Dust to dust,' he murmured, "'ashes to ashes.' It was the end of the career of Anthony Trent, writer. And on the table which had formerly held only writing-paper, a quaint miscellany was placed, eight scarf-pins, each holding in golden claws stones of price." Apparently Connington Warren had about him only what was good, and there was a heavy platinum ring with a ruby of not less than four carats, a lady's ring. It would not be difficult for a man so clever with his hands and apt mechanically to remove these jewels from their setting, nor was there any difficulty in melting the precious metals. It seemed to Trent that he had gloated over these glistening stones for hours before he put them away. Then he took out a roll of bills and counted them. Connaughton Warren, it seemed, must have had considerable faith in the excellent Togoyama, now hurrying to the Adirondack camp, for he had left three thousand dollars in the upper left-hand drawer of a Sheraton desk. Morning was coming down the skies when Trent, now in dressing-gown, lighted his pipe and sat down by the window. "'Well,' he muttered softly, "'I've done it, and there's no going back. Yesterday I was what people call an honest man. Now?' He shrugged his shoulders and puffed quickly. Out of the window great clouds of smoke rose as fragrant incense. 
He had never meant to take up a career of crime. Looking back, he could see how little things coming together had provoked in him an insatiable desire for an easier life. In all his personal dealings heretofore, he had been scrupulously honest, and there had never been any reflection on his honour as a sportsman. He had played games for their own sake. He had won without bragging and lost without excuses. Up in Hanover there were still left those who chanted his praise. What would people think of him if he were placed in the dock as a criminal? His own people were dead. There were distant cousins in Cleveland whom he hardly remembered. There was no family honour to trail in the dust, no mother or sweetheart to blame him for a broken heart. He stirred uneasily as he thought of the possibility of capture. Even now those might be on his trail who would arrest him. It would be ironical if, before he tasted the fruits of leisure, he were taken to prison, perhaps by Officer McGuire. It had all been so absurdly easy. Within a few minutes of receiving the forged note, the Japanese was on his way to the mountains. The bishop-like butler, who adored his master, according to Crosby, had seemed utterly without suspicion when he passed Trent engaged in animated converse with his supposed employer. The bad moment was when the man had come into the library where the intruder was hiding himself and stood there waiting for an answer to his question. Trent had seen to it that the light was low. It was a moment of inspiration when he called to mind Connington Warren's imperious gesture as he waved away Voisin's head waiter, and another which had made him put on the velvet smoking jacket, and it had all come out without a hitch. But he was playing a game now when he could never be certain he was not outguessed. It might be the suave butler was outside in the shadows guiding police to the capture. He looked out of the window and down the silent street. There was indeed a man outside, and looking up at him. But it was only poor Clark, whose own prescription had been too well filled. He had captured, so he fancied, an errant lamp-post, wantonly disporting itself. Anthony Trent looked at him with a relief in which disgust had its part. He swore by all the high gods never to sink to that level. A curious turn of mind, perhaps, for a burglar to take but so far the sporting simile presented itself to him. It was a game, a big game, in which he took bigger risks than anyone else. He was going to pit his wit, strength, and knowledge against society as it was organized. "'I don't see why I can't play it decently,' he said to himself as he climbed into bed. End of chapter 4